Now, it doesn't take an enormous amount of mental power, intellect, or wisdom to know that our world desperately needs for wisdom to make a serious comeback. You just merely read the news, right? Or, or scroll through your social media feed and you sit there wondering if the world has any hope, right? Is there any hope for humanity? Because what it seems like we're lacking in this world right now is wisdom. It's wisdom. And when God's people talk about wisdom, one of the first things that comes to mind is the book of Proverbs, right? When we think of the great wisdom literature in Scripture, this is the thing that comes to mind. In fact, it consistently ranks in the top five in terms of the most favorite and beloved books that Christians love to read and love to spend time in. In fact, memorize and and quote and, and all of these things. Proverbs just ranks right on top of there. I know in the course of my own life personally, reading through the Proverbs over the last three or so decades of my Christian walk, I have been enormously and richly blessed by the content of Proverbs in terms of how it's, it's guided me through life and given me insight into uh, relationships and situations. Oh, how people read Proverbs and the way they approach Proverbs, there are a number of, and variety of ways people do that. A lot of people treat uh, Proverbs like it's just a book of helpful tips. Helpful phrases and sayings, right? A, a book of, of, of manners, of teaching common sense, if you will. Or a book that kind of generally dispenses wisdom like a Dr. Phil or a Dave Ramsey on finance. And f- for the older ones among us, like Dear Abby, you know, I don't even, she's probably not alive to this day, but there are a number of copycats there, right? Wherever she is, right? But, but is that how we're supposed to read? Proverbs. Is the the Bible, is Proverbs here like the biblical version of Twitter? Just in how many condensed characters can we get a truth out or a truism out? Some read Proverbs like it's a fortune cookie. Let's crack it open and see what it says. Now, be honest with me, some of you like fortune cookies because it's got the lotto numbers on the back. (laughs) But Proverbs isn't like that, right? People love to memorize and quote Proverbs, right? We all probably have our favorite Proverbs. Like Betts have read one of my favorite ones today from Proverbs chapter 3, right? It's probably one of the first scriptures that I memorized as a young Christian, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lead not into your understandings, acknowledge the Lord in all your ways, and he'll do what? Direct your steps, guide your paths, right? We all have favorite Proverbs. I know parents love Proverbs twenty two fifteen. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but what? The rod of correction right, drives it far from them, right? You all have your favorite Proverbs, right? But why are we going to personally study Proverbs? How are we going to approach Proverbs and look at it? So I'm going to give you just a few brief reasons why that is, though there are many. The first is it's because it's God's Word, plain and simple. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all Scripture is breathed out by God, expelled from the mouth and nostrils of God. It's inspired by God, and it's profitable for all of us. It teaches us, corrects us, reproves us, instructs us in every way. So Proverbs is in your Bible. That means it's God's Word to us. And we want to know what God is saying to us. We're also studying Proverbs because it is full of practical, godly wisdom. When you think of one of the most practical books of the Bible, you think of Proverbs. I mean, there's, we just finished a year-long study in Revelation, one of the most difficult books to comprehend, understand, make sense of, right? And so we think of books like that. We think of Leviticus, and we're like, what is all that about? But then we're like, ah, there's Proverbs, you know? It's practical. It can help me right now. At least we can see that a little bit more clearly, we're commanded, the scripture tells us, to get wisdom, to ask for wisdom. And this is the book that really helps us towards that end. We're studying Proverbs also because it is a very misunderstood, misapplied, misquoted portion of scripture. So we're going to bring some correction. We're going to bring some understanding. We're going to teach you how to read Proverbs. What are they really all about? And How do we apply them to our life? How do these things work out in our walk with God? But ultimately, here's why we're going to study 
Proverbs. We're going to study Proverbs so that you and I can get a more glorious picture of Jesus Christ. And you're going to see that, I believe, as we go through Proverbs. Now, Bruce Waltke, I want to read you a quote from the preface of his brilliant commentary. Um, He's probably one of the foremost scholars when it comes to Proverbs. Wrote this. In a world bombarded by inane cliches, trivial catchwords, and godless sound bites, the expression of true wisdom is in short supply today. The church stands alone as the receptacle and repository of the inspired traditions that carry a mandate for a holy life from ancient sages, the greatest of whom was Solomon, and from the greater than Solomon, Jesus Christ. As the course and bulk of biblical wisdom, the book of Proverbs remains the model of curriculum for humanity to learn how to live under God and before humankind. As a result, it beckons the church to diligent study and application. So that's why we are reading and studying and meditating upon Proverbs. We all need wisdom. Who here does not need wisdom? We all need wisdom. We're going to find in wisdom there is something for every single one of us, regardless of what we are facing in life. It speaks to us, and Proverbs are are going to help guide us towards the treasure that wisdom has in store for us. Let's turn to the word of the Lord, the first chapter of Proverbs, the first seven verses. Hear the words of the Lord. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity. To give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. These are the words of the Lord. Now, first of all, let's, let's do some little background work here, just kind of as an introduction to Proverbs to get a little grasp on, on its author, its purpose, and all of these things. The first thing I want to look at here, because this first verse actually tells us a few important things about what we're about to embark in. And it tells us immediately its literary genre, the style in which it is going to communicate the words that we're reading to us. It's the Proverbs of Solomon. It's going to communicate to us via this mechanism, this tool, this vehicle called Proverbs. And Proverbs itself as a book falls under the biblical category of wisdom literature, also called poetic literature of Scripture. It's one of five books, which also includes Job and, and Ecclesiastes and Psalms and Song of Solomon, right? This is what what Proverbs falls under. And Proverbs themselves are methods of instruction, vehicles of teaching. Now, when we think of Proverbs, we we do think of like these short, pithy statements, generally universally accepted truths that most people would consider uh, truisms, right? And And they're done in a very concise, portable, you know, fashion for us to explain truth. Like, you know some of these as it is, and you can finish them off if you know them. All that glitters is not. Beggars can't be. Actions speak louder than. Don't judge a book by its. Honesty is the best. Yeah, see? Universally accepted, you know, short, pithy statements, truth, portable truth here that we take. But it's not what Proverbs are. Is that the same thing that we're looking at? Maybe, we'll see. The Hebrew noun that we translate as proverb is the Hebrew word mashal. Okay? It means wisdom sayings. It's used that way in scripture or, or just of sayings in general. Uh, but they convey, the word conveys the sense of a condensed, memorable saying embodying some important fact of experience that is generally taken to be true by most people. Proverbs are wisdom sayings themselves. But that noun is related to another Hebrew word, 
That means to represent or to be like. So a proverb is then a verbal representation. It's like a model of some aspect of life. Some dealing of life. Some interaction of life. A biblical uh, proverb is something that is meant to be pondered, mulled over, meditated upon, turned around, to be seen by different angles because it reflects something about our lives before we actually experience the thing. Proverbs beckon us to learn before we live, right? The world's motto is live and learn, right? Experience is the best teacher. Is that really what the scripture teaches us though? No, that the scripture beckons us to learn and then live. God's word is to instruct us. God's truth is to instruct our life and then we live our life out of that particular truth. You know, I think about when I was teaching Ariel to drive. Now, and when you taught your child to drive, did you just throw him behind the wheel of the car and say, get to it, live and learn, you know? Experience is the best teacher. Best to throw you in the deep end. No, what I do? I took her to a, I took her to an empty mall parking lot. Not a vehicle in sight. Buildings as far away, you know, as as can be. So I can let her begin to experience what it is like to be behind the wheel of a car and navigate it and drive it. Then she got some mastery. We got on the road with other cars, and by God's grace. She's not hit any there, and I trust that she never will, right? But that's, that's what we do, right? We don't, just, we don't just tell them, go live and figure it out. That's not going to lead to success, generally. Proverbs, in a sense, are like virtual reality. They allow us to look at and explore real-life situations and experiences and know how in advance we are to act and respond And know what to expect before we actually take the action. Proverbs are like a flight simulator. Imagine we just threw pilots right into the cockpit of the airplane. and go, take off. Right? No, right? I'd rather our pilots in training crash in that flight simulator before they do so in the side of a mountain in real life. These wisdom sayings give us a glimpse of real life. So that you and I can begin to order our life accordingly to God's way. So that it will lead to the right path and general success in life. Number two, let's look at the declared author there that is stated in verse one. They are the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Now, the Bible clearly tells us Solomon is the author. These are his Proverbs. But as you read Proverbs, you come to realize well, he's not the only author of Proverbs. There's actually other names mentioned there that of, of their particular Proverbs. Proverbs themselves are a collection of collections, if you will. Okay? There's actually seven collections found in the Scriptures that are, are divided by their particular uh, headings. And in, in the worship guide, I have listed those uh, seven verse headings there for you. Okay? There's the general Proverbs there in verse 10 and on that are clearly attributed to Solomon himself. They are his Proverbs. There are Proverbs of Solomon that were copied and compiled, collected by the men of Hezekiah or King Hezekiah's men, depending on how your translation said. Still Proverbs of Solomon, but they were assembled, amassed, compiled, collected, maybe modified and adapted some way a few hundred years after Solomon by King Hezekiah. Hezekiah's wise men. You have the 30 sayings of the wise, the words or the oracles of Agar. You have the sayings of King Lemuel, who uh, most scholars believe was not, uh, was not an Israelite, was most likely a pagan. Uh, but we come to find out and understand that in the ancient Near East, uh, this aspect of learning wisdom was a big deal. And Solomon himself would have had access to learn uh, from the sayings of wise men throughout that region. And their sayings were adapted and modified and incorporated into the Proverbs that he wrote. We'll talk more about that here in the future. Then there's also the unnamed author of the section we call the Proverbs 31 woman. The ideal woman, right? The perfect woman that every woman aspires to be. Now, 
You're gonna have, we're going to have fun when we get to Proverbs 31. Right? But that, in a good way, in a good way. But, but that, it's an unnamed author. We don't know who wrote that. We can only speculate. It may have been Solomon. It may have been someone else. All right? So that's what, you, that's what you have there. Different authors, but generally attributed to Solomon. Now, this makes it hard to date the writing of the Proverbs because just from that, you can see that it spanned several centuries. Hezekiah's reign was around 970 B.C. I mean, rather, Solomon's reign began around 970 B.C. Uh, King Hezekiah's around 686 to 690 B.C. That's a long time. Lots of Proverbs, you know. So we don't really exactly know when it was, but this is actually something that was compiled and cataloged the way it is uh, in a more, more much recent date after Hezekiah's reign. So why do we largely attribute pro- Proverbs to Solomon himself? Well, right there at the opening of this, you see that Proverbs connects itself with the monarchy of ancient Israel, right? Because he's the king. He's the king of Israel. He's David's son. He's David's successor to the throne. In fact, Solomon was the last king to rule over a united Israel. After his reign, this thing went into civil war mode. Right? The kingdom began to fracture and fall apart, splitting into the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. This was the last king to reign uh, under a unified Israel. And during Solomon's reign, the kingdom of Israel actually reached its apex in terms of power and glory and influence and wealth and peace and prosperity. It was, by all accounts, the heyday of Israel. Glorious time. I mean, you, you read the story in First Kings, which I encourage you to do, of Solomon's reign and the kingdom of Israel during that time. You'll see that's, that's as good as it got from an earthly perspective. Solomon is largely presented as a good king when you read about him in First Kings uh, and, and presiding over a great kingdom. He established a great kingdom. So Solomon is the person that the Bible sets forth as the greatest sage the wisest person that has ever lived, that has ever walked this earth. Let's read a a portion here from 1 Kings chapter 4, 29 through 34, where the Lord says, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind like the sand of the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all other wise men, wiser than Ethan the Ezraite, and He-Man, master of the universe, Calcol and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And look, his fame was in all the surrounding nations. Think about the, the spread of his fame and influence. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts and of birds and of reptiles and of fish. And people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. It's phenomenal. But the most important thing is that that first verse we read. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure. The source of Solomon's wisdom was not innate, was not natural, was not something he was born with or something that he learned. It was given to him by God. It was given to him by the Lord. And the scripture makes that clear over and over again. When you read 1 Kings 3, you'll see that that Solomon loved the Lord. He, He obeyed and followed the statutes that his father David had instructed him in. And and one of the things that happens when a king ascends the throne here in Deuteronomy 17, it instructs instructs God's people, when a king comes to rule over to you, here's what the king is supposed to do. They are supposed to personally hand write a copy of the law, supervised and approved by the priests. And they are to read that copy of the law day and night. Over and over again. They need to get God's law in their heart. They are to keep it and obey it. And to fear the Lord all the days of their life. And that's what it says Solomon did. There's that portion then where he goes to offer sacrifices at Gibeon. And there the Lord puts him to sleep. And in a dream the Lord appears to him. And he asks him, ask what I shall give you. Ask what shall I give you. 
What if God were to ask you that question? How would you respond? Ask what I shall give you. Now, I don't think most of us would ask for some whack stuff or just selfish things. You know, we might ask for general health and the welfare of people or for our kids or you know, something like that. But what, what, what will we ask? I begin to see here, too, that at, at, when Solomon took, took the throne of Israel, he was probably a teenager. He was young. In fact, when you read that story, he even says to the Lord, I'm a little child. I'm a young man. We don't know how old he was when he took the throne. Maybe 14, 15, 16. Probably not much older than that. Okay? So what if God were to ask our teenagers, ask, what shall I give you? In the world, it would be, I want to be, a, I want to be an internet influencer with millions of followers and endorsement deals and sponsorships. Not our teenagers. I'm just talking about in general, right? Our teenagers will ask, for godly things. <laughs> but, but Solomon's response is truly remarkable. When, when he answers the Lord, he rehearses the goodness of God. He rehearses the faithfulness of God in keeping his covenant promises that were made to his father, David. He says he knows he's leading God's chosen people. A people that are vast and numerous according to the promises of the covenant that God made with Abraham. So he recognizes that. He recognizes God's faithfulness. So what does he ask for? 1 Kings 3.9 Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this, your great people? That is phenomenal. Just as an aside, think about what he asks for there. That I may discern between good and evil. Where have we heard that before? Way back in the garden, right? Where our first parents wanted to take for themselves knowledge of, the, of good and evil apart from God. And here he's saying, give me discernment to know that very same thing that was accessible to Adam and Eve, just not the way they took it. In disobedience, right? But he's asking here for wisdom and discernment and all that. And God grants that to him. And not just that, because he didn't ask for all the selfish things that maybe the rest of us would ask for. He goes, I'm going to give you everything else. Things you didn't even ask for. Riches and glory. And, and, and if you continue to obey me, you, you'll be on the throne for a long, long time. God then declares that there will be none like him who would come before him and none like him who would come after him. But ultimately, who gets the credit for Solomon's wisdom? God. God gets all of the credit for that. Then immediately following that scene, we get an actual demonstration of this great wisdom that Solomon possesses. Read it there in the last part of 1 Kings 3. We find that the king is holding court and two prostitutes present themselves before the king. One is bringing up charges against the, uh, against the other person. We find out these two prostitutes, they lived uh, in the same house and they all, both gave birth around the same time. So they both had newborn babies. And then sometime during the night, the one accuses that the other one must have rolled over on her baby, suffocating her baby, killing the, her baby, and then in the middle of the night, tipped over, tiptoed over to the other lady's room and took her living baby and swapped. Swapped the baby. Now, she wakes up the next morning to find what she thought was her baby dead. But mamas know their babies, don't they? Mamas know how their babies smell. They certainly, hopefully, can tell how they look. can tell them apart. He says, this is not my baby. And she finds her baby in the bosom of the other woman. So this is why they're here. Of course, the other woman is denying it. And it's very clear the first woman who's bringing the charges says, no one else saw this happen. We were alone in the house. That presents a big dilemma. Who is telling the truth here? Who's telling the truth? Now, what's Solomon going to do with this? He's the king, right? His word is the final word. He's to render judgment and render justice for the aggrieved party if he indeed determines the right course of action here. 
Well, he can't order a DNA test, can he? Most likely they had not taken baby pictures yet. Right? Little, little baby wrapped up in a little shell or something. Those little cute little baby pictures. So nobody could tell whose baby was whose baby at this particular, uh, 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 this particular moment here. And again, there's no witnesses that could be called. What is he to do? Solomon orders that a sword be brought to him. And then he commands, cut the baby in half. Split him in half. Give one to the one lady, give one to the other. And you can imagine, what? The king's ordered it. It's going to get done. That's the graphic. It's a classically uh, painted, uh, classical painted picture there. That's part of the graphic for our series here is, is of this particular story. What are they going to do? Well, the first woman, whose baby it was, who's living, it's the mom. What mom wants to see her baby killed and die? She pleads with the king, no, 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 no. let him live, let him live. Go ahead and give him to the other lady. And the other lady's like, go split him in half. That sounds like a good deal. That way we both get our fair share, right? Better half a baby than no baby. But the truth is disclosed, isn't it? In that, in that matter, in that moment, Solomon knows exactly who the baby belongs to. And he orders that the baby, the living baby, be given to his rightful mother. It's wise. The wisdom here, right? In that. 1 Kings 3.28 says this. All of Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered. And they stood in awe of the king. Look. Because they had perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to do justice. Isn't that amazing? It's like everybody was blown away like that only God. That's only wisdom from God. God has given our king wisdom. So this is a good king. It's the hallmark of a good king. That, that right justice uh, is, is measured and meted out. A righteous and good king helps the oppressed, the disenfranchised, and the, the helpless of society. So, so they witness this act and like, this, this, this is the wisdom of God. So Solomon's fame spread far and wide. People from all nations, kings streamed in from faraway lands to hear of his wisdom, uh, to, to ask him hard sayings, and to bring him lots of gifts. Read that in First Kings. Lots of gifts, right? And then they have the account of the Queen of Sheba who comes to test him with hard questions. And she is just blown away by his responses. And she says, the half of what was told to me isn't even, I mean, it's just far beyond that, right? And she showers him with a lot of gifts as well. This wisdom that God given him was, was put into, into practice with the building of God's temple. And, and if it, with it, we see that he wrote thousands of Proverbs, right? Uh, the sayings of the wise, he adapted them, compiled them, right? So, so when we're talking about why is Solomon listed as the author, there's good compelling reason to say he is the author of Proverbs. Maybe not the exclusive author, but we can see that God's word declares him to be so. Now, who is this book intended for? Like, who is the original audience of this book? Right? It's important for us to know that so that we can actually understand it. Uh, we're going to get through the first nine chapters, and we, we see them as, as these, these letters, if you will, written from a father to a son. Okay? Uh, so that's a particular style of, of ancient Near East wisdom literature, of how it teaches and instructs. But ultimately, there's three main audiences that were in view here for the original audience of Proverbs. The first, you might not realize, but ultimately it was for the courtiers in training. Those who would be part of the royal court. There is a ton of instruction in Proverbs. You're like, how to behave in, before the king and before the, if you're, when you're in the palace and all of these things. And you're like, why is that even in there? Well, because... This is what a lot of these Proverbs were written for. For those who served in the palace of the king. So they knew how to behave before the king. If you didn't behave rightly before the king. It would not go well with you in the land. Right? Uh, Secondly, it was written for the youth of Israel. Proverbs are a manual for the training of young people. The exhortations, the instructions, the teachings are all geared to give sound knowledge and instruction and insight to the youth. Those who would benefit the most from it. Why? Well, God's word instructs us to train up 
the young people, but they're the, they're the ones who have the least experience in life. They are still in development, right? And this would be a way to begin to mold and shape their lives in the way of wisdom, in the path of wisdom, so that they would avoid folly <clears throat> and pursue the way of wisdom. So I want to encourage our young people here as well to begin to get into the book of Proverbs, to read it and study and learn from it and memorize it and take it into your heart so that it can direct your path. Lastly, it is for all of God's people. Proverbs is part of your Bible, isn't it? It's part of the Old Testament canon of literature, right? So it's for all of God's people. It benefits all of God's people in all stages of life, okay? These ancient... Sages become our wisdom coaches, and they have been for God's people for a long, long time. Quickly here, let's look at its structure and style. Um, There's two main components uh, to Proverbs, uh, even though we're going to subdivide it further later. But the first are chapters 1 through 9. These are, in a sense, um, some poetic pieces here, these lectures, right? Poetic lectures, if you will, that are written. Again, instructions from father to a son. Uh, And then we have these two interludes of Lady Wisdom, right, that we're going to study as well. Uh, There in that one through nine, the way it's, it's the father is pleading for the son, in essence, what he's doing is selling wisdom, the blessings and benefits of wisdom to his son instructing his son to hold on to his teachings and to choose the right path, the path of wisdom and not of folly. Why is this important? To whom did God give the responsibility of the instruction of children? Yeah, yeah. mom and dad. Specifically to dad, but it's both, right? Parents. Deuteronomy 6 tells us to do what? To instruct our children in the law of God, to teach them. At all times, in all ways, it's our responsibility. Parents, it's our responsibility for the education and instruction of our children. Our culture loves to outsource that, but the buck stops with the parents. We're the ones who are going to be called into account on the day as we stand before the Lord for how we instructed our children. That's our responsibility. It's also then the responsibility of our children to receive the instruction. To obey the commands. You'll you'll find the father pleading here. Hold fast. Don't lose sight. Bind them around your neck. Like don't let go of my teachings. Do them and, and you will live. So kids. Let me have your attention for a moment. You have a responsibility before God too. To listen and obey your parents. Because God is the one who's given them charge to teach you. And everything they tell you to do, when you obey them, guess who you're also obeying? You're also obeying God. You're also obeying God. I'll say more about that in a few moments. The first part of this book then tells us why we should care about getting wisdom. Why should we care about choosing the way of wisdom, the path of wisdom over the path of folly? The second part's the rest of the book, 10 through 31. That contains... Uh, the Proverbs themselves, these, these, their own little tiny units of, of teaching, right? And when you look at the Proverbs and you read them, you're like, this is just like random. And it does look like that. And in some cases, it may very well be. But there is actually a very cohesive arrangement to the Proverbs that we're going to look at. And specifically, when we get to that part two or three years from now. <laughs> no, it won't be that long. It won't be that long. One year. No. We're, we're going we're gonna to look at the larger themes of Proverbs, and then we're going to begin to group a lot of these uh, under those larger theme headings as we study them. All right, let's move on here. Let's look at the purpose of Proverbs, because this is what this passage is all about. Verse 2 through 4 tell us the purpose, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing and righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple knowledge and discretion to the youth. That's the purpose of Proverbs. But the first is the important one. It's to know wisdom. To know wisdom. That's the purpose of Proverbs. Now, there's other related words uh, to wisdom and and ideas that we're going to look at. But ultimately, wisdom is what is presented and held up in Proverbs for us. But knowing wisdom is not just about gaining information. 
It's not about intellect, right? And gaining just knowledge. Because that's not how the Bible uses the word wisdom. It's not just about being smart, all right? Um, We're going to see that as we go through Proverbs, wisdom has a much larger idea in view here. And that, that, that it actually has ethical and moral components to it as well. Wisdom is the, he, uh, is the Hebrew word chokmah. Chokmah. Now, I don't spit when you say that, but chokmah. Um, and, and, it's, and this is why it's important, because it's translated a few different ways in our Bible um, as ability and skill, because that's exactly what the word means. Right? When, we, when we read that word, wisdom there, the word chokmah, right, refers to technical skill, experience, ability, and aptitude, right? So knowledge is part of that, intellect, knowing things, but it's beyond that. Uh, let me give you an example of how this is used in the, in the scripture. Uh, this specifically in the instructions that God gave Moses for the building of the tabernacle. Exodus 31, 1 through 5, the Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with chokmah, ability, and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, For what purpose? To devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. God gave him what? Wisdom. Wisdom. Not to philosophize, but to do artistic work and design and craftsmanship in the building of the tabernacle, right? So what is wisdom then? Wisdom is a skill. Wisdom is the skill. We could actually call it the skill of living life. So we could define wisdom then as the skill of living rightly. It's taking knowledge and instruction and insight and knowing how to skillfully apply it in all of life. That's how wisdom is seen in view here in the scripture here. It's not just about getting knowledge. We all know people who are really smart and do really dumb things, right? So wisdom is not just about, oh, I know all of these things, right? It's, it's beyond that, right? The skill of wisdom applies to all of life. Our decision-making, how we speak, how we conduct ourselves in various settings, how we relate to others, how we raise our children, how we navigate marriage, how we view and perceive the world. Why do we need Biblical wisdom so that we can rightly understand the world, perceive it, and act orderly and according to God's word and ways. We need wisdom for that. And that is a skill. Secondly, it's to know instruction. Which is, uh, in some of your translations, also seen as discipline or correction. Discipline. That's the word there. To know discipline. Now, discipline carries with itself the threat of punishment or the application Uh, of punishment or correction if it's not obeyed, right? But what is the purpose of discipline? Is it just to beat our children? To hurt them? Don't say yes. I have an obligation then to report you. There's a purpose to discipline, isn't it? It's to teach them the right way to live, isn't it? Ultimately, we don't correct our children, hopefully, when they do things right. It's when they do things in the wrong way, or they're going down the wrong path, right? A rebellious child, right? And we discipline them, rather, and we punish them because we know a very important truth. The way a child responds to their parents is the way that they're going to respond to God. And a child who is rebellious and disobedient and is not disciplined is not going to obey God, and it will not go well for them, right? Isn't that... The commandment given to us, honor your father and mother, attachment of the promise, so that it what? Will go well with you in the land. It will not go well with you if you're disobedient to your parents, or dis- ultimately disobedient, disobedient to God. Now sometimes the punishment can be verbal or physical, but oftentimes that punishment comes naturally, because it's the consequence of a person taking the wrong path and disobeying and making foolish decisions. We're also, the purpose here is to understand words of insight. Words of insight. 
What is insight? Insight is the ability to recognize the true nature of a situation. When we say, make a comment like, wow, that person had great insight into that relationship. What they, they're seeing something that most people maybe cannot perceive or see. And insight and this ability to understand words of insight is a key component in the toolbox of wisdom. Because the wise person will know how to speak and how to act appropriately. That's a great problem in our world today. People do not know how to speak and they do not know how to act appropriately. They don't know how to read the room. They don't know how to read people and they just act the fool. All right? And that's a problem. All right, the purpose of Proverbs is also to receive instruction, and the ESV translates this as wise dealing. I'm not a fan of that translation. The NIV renders it to receive instruction in prudent behavior, or the CSV, prudent instruction. Uh, But in the original language, I think the New Living Translation actually captures this, this translation very, very well here. That is, the purpose of Proverbs is to teach people to live Disciplined and successful lives. Disciplined and successful lives. And I think that's a helpful a translation of uh, the difficult Hebrew language here. It's to help us live disciplined and successful lives. But to what end? It's not just success for success sake. It's not just so I can be wealthy and have, you know, all the treasure and all the toys. It's to do righteousness, justice, and equity. That's the purpose of it. That we learn to live disciplined and successful lives so that, and these are ethical terms, aren't they? To do righteousness, to do justice and equity, what is right and just and fair. These are actions that we can only do when we possess wisdom. That's why we say wisdom in Proverbs has an ethical quality. It's not just a truism, it's more than that. That's why we have to understand that it's more than just possessing information and knowledge. Another purpose of Proverbs is to give prudence to the simple. Now, this is kind of putting us now in understanding the bullseye of two categories that Proverbs addresses and speaks to directly. Okay? Now, again, the general older audience here was the royal court officials that were learning how to behave in the court and the the youth of Israel and and the people of God generally. But two categories here that the first is the simple. The other one's going to be the wise, and we'll talk about that in a moment here. All right? The, the, the simple is kind of the bullseye of the arrow that Proverbs is aimed at. Now, when we think of a simple person, we don't mean dumb. Okay? That's not what this word means. Uh, it doesn't mean, you know, just someone who just cannot comprehend anything. No, it, it, at its core, it means a, a, a naive person, okay? an ignorant person, but not a dumb person. Immature might be a good term to use as well. Uh, It's someone that is not a fool. However, if they're not put onto the right path, can easily be swayed or deceived into going down the wrong path. This is why the book is aimed at young people, right? Young people are still being developed. They're still naive about things of the world. They don't really understand how the world works. I know a lot of our young people think that they know how the world works. You don't know how the world works. Some of us are old and we still can't figure out how all the world works, right? Which is why we need wisdom, right? But, but largely, you know, the, the unformed can be shaped. They're malleable. They're teachable. Okay? This is why it's important to have a teachable and humble spirit, right? Because that puts you in a position to learn wisdom, to get wisdom and grow in insight. Proverbs gives prudence, knowledge, and discretion to the simple. So it develops them as people along the right path. That's why it's important for our, for, to teach our children, to teach our young, pip, young people wisdom here. Okay? It, it's critical. I mean, when you have this, you can actually make decisions. I think one of the challenges of our days is, 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 is this decision paralysis. A lot of God's people have that too. Oh, I, I got to know the perfect will of God. I, I, don't, I don't know how to know God's will and discern God's will. Well, get wisdom and you'll be able to do that. You'll be able to do that. Okay? And we're going to talk about that in a lot of different examples as we go through this series here. But decisions are going to be able to be made a lot easier when we have wisdom, when we have understanding, when we have insight. 
And this idea of knowing the perfect will of God is not getting just a specific word. It is that person and not that person. Why? Because wisdom gives us the tools to make right informed decisions. Like, let me blow one out of the water right here. Because this is one I was taught in and I was, when I was young. There is only one right spouse for you in all of the world. There's only one. And if you don't find the right one, you're out of the will of God. That's how I was taught. That was the fear. Like, oh. And so, you, yeah, you're actually with someone and you're like, is this the right one? <sighs> Got to know God's will. God, give me a put out fleece. God, give me a sign. If I wake up and my laptop's upside down, then she's not from you. But if, but if it's open, uh, you know, then to Proverbs 31, then I know she's from you. But that's how, that's how I was taught. I know a lot of you from that background were probably taught that way. There's only one, and if you miss it, you are so out of the will of God, you've blown it the rest of your life. No, but what does wisdom do? Wisdom, wisdom teaches us God's word. Wisdom helps us to evaluate what are the qualities of an individual that is a godly woman or a godly man, the qualities of life that make them a suitable spouse, life partner, husband, wife. Because God's word teaches us that. So when we come upon a person, and it's not the list that, you know, some young ladies especially make. They gotta be tall, dark, handsome, ripped, make $250,000 a year, uh, you know. No, no, no. These are virtues and qualities that the scripture upholds for us, right? So that we then, as men and women of wisdom, can make decisions that are right. That are right. And generally, when we do that, guess what? Our life is blessed. All right? We're going we're gonna to get into that later on. Not today. Later. <laughs> Two or three years from now. <laughs> the purpose of Proverbs is also to impart the ability to the wise to interpret Proverbs. This is the second category, right? Proverbs are also for those who are wise already. And if you're wise, you actually get to increase in learning, right? That's the other target. on Because there's, they're mature, because they already possess some of the skills of wisdom, when they hear Proverbs and study Proverbs, they actually grow wiser. The wise person is the one who knows when and how to apply a particular proverb. Because here's, here's, the, here's the catch, guys. The Proverbs are context-sensitive, They don't always apply in every situation. Like one of the famous one is, when to answer the fool. Answer him according to his folly. Don't answer him according to his folly. Huh? That sounds like a contradiction. It's not. The context, the fool, determines whether or not you're going to respond to him according to his own folly. To show him the error of his ways. Right? They're context sensitive. And a wise person knows how to... uh, uh, interpret and rightly apply the words. Let's get into the theme of Proverbs now here, because we're coming to the verse 7 here, and this is the key verse of the whole book. The key of the whole book is verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, also wisdom. It's, this, it's an interchangeable word for this one. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord it's a phrase you're going to see repeated several times uh, in, in Proverbs. Uh, and it's important because, you know, I, I, I was reading through some online articles and different things people have written about Proverbs and, and even some, some scholars who said, you know, it's probably not good for churches to teach through the book of Proverbs because it doesn't really have any theological or doctrinal teaching. Like the law of God is not explicitly stated in Proverbs. And that's true from that perspective. Uh, but here's why I disagree with that. And it's right there in the phrase, the fear of the Lord. If you look in your Bible, and depending on which translation you're reading, that word Lord could either say Yahweh, or Lord if it's in, uh, it's, if it's in title case in your translation, that is the covenant name of the Lord. This isn't the general term God, label God, category God, Elohim. It's the covenant name of God. To who does the covenant name of God belong to? It's to the covenant people of God. That's whom God revealed himself as I am to. To his people. 
And Proverbs exclusively uses the covenant name of God, of Yahweh, of I am. So this is why this verse is the theological foundation of this book. It is written exclusively for a covenant people. It is written exclusively for people who are in relationship with I am. And apart from a relationship with I am, you cannot truly know wisdom. You cannot truly be wise because there is no wisdom without God. Now, there might be some of you here who say we kind of push back a little bit. Oh, there's a lot of wise people in this world. Yeah, there's earthly wisdom. Yeah, there are people who have a general, they can look at things from a, from a natural perspective and make observations in the world. That's what a lot of these, these ancient sages did. They observed things in the world and made these, these statements about them. And, and some of them are generally true. But the wisdom we've just been talking about can only come from God. And can only come to a people who are in relationship with God. Because it's not a natural quality. It is not something you're born with. It is God-given. And it's the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of this knowledge. Again, wisdom is the interchangeable term. The bookend verse of this at the end of this first section in chapter 9-10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. It's insight. Now, this word beginning doesn't mean the starting line of wisdom, right? Like this is step one. One, the fear of the Lord is the beginning. Start. That's not what it means, right? When it talks about beginning, it's talking about the essence of wisdom, right? The, the sum of what it means to have wisdom is embodied in the fear of the Lord. A person who is in right relationship to Yahweh. Now, fear here, of course, does not mean to be afraid. We're not afraid of God like we're afraid of spiders and snakes and other things, Fear the Lord in the scripture, it's very clear, right? It's having a right view of who God is. A reverence for the holiness and perfection of God. A reverential awe of God. A recognition of his supremacy and might and majesty and glory. So a person who fears the Lord is a person that is in right relationship with him. That's the beginning of wisdom, right? It's the key to it. The last part of that is fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is the category of person that is excluded from any possibility of wisdom. Proverbs isn't addressed to them. Proverbs uses them as a foil against, you know, a foil of the simple and the wise. The fool is excluded because the fool despises wisdom and instruction. At the core, the fool rejects God. That's what Psalm 53, 1 tells us. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So who's the fool contrasted with the wise in Proverbs? Hey, fool's not just a dumb person or a silly person or someone who's joking all of the time. I want you to see how severe this term is and what it refers to in Proverbs. A fool is the one who hates God. A fool is the one who hates God's law. The one who hates knowledge and does not choose the fear of the Lord. The fool is the one who is immature, unteachable, arrogant, boastful, lacks sense, who has no insight, who doesn't listen to wisdom, who's always running their mouth, who makes unwise decisions, doesn't listen to counsel, disobeys their parents, doesn't learn from past mistakes, and is on the path that leads to Destruction. Folly in Proverbs is seen as wickedness, evil, and a perversion of all that is right. That's why you find wisdom crying out, don't be a fool. Forsake folly. Why? Because it leads only one direction, to death. And that person doesn't get wisdom. So I ask you, do you fear the Lord? Do you fear the Lord? If you do, you are in a position to receive wisdom and instruction and insight. To grow in the skill of living rightly. And if you lack it, well, we have good news for that too. We're we're, we're told to ask for it. 
If you're humble and simple and say, I lack wisdom, I want wisdom, ask for it, right? James 1.5 tells us if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. You can ask for it. I'm going to close with this portion here because I want you to, to know the approach that we're going to take with Proverbs here, and I want you to see the gospel uh, in Proverbs you know, when you're studying an Old Testament book, you're always wanting to know, how does this tie into the gospel, into the New Testament, specifically to Jesus Christ? But the approach we're going to take here in our study is to help us see that wisdom is not a what. Wisdom is a who. That wisdom is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. The wisdom that Proverbs points us to is the person who's the sum of all wisdom. And it points us to the person that we must embrace in order to become wise. And if we don't, we will not. As wise as Solomon was, he did not finish well. He didn't finish well. In fact, we really can't hold Solomon up as the model for us to go after. When we look to the end of his life in 1 Kings 11, 1 through 4, it's, it's truly sad. Scripture says, now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. From the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. Isn't that terrifying? He completely disobeyed the law of God. He had 700 wives. That's a huge problem right there. (laughs) Who were princesses or divas. I'm not sure what the translation's there. And 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. See, the heart's the whole issue that Proverbs targets and addresses. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. It's horrible. I mean, when you think about how the scripture puts him forth as the wisest man who ever lives and the end of his life, what was that wisdom for? It's terrible. The story of Solomon created a longing in the heart of God's people for a king who was not only wise, but a king who would always be and remain faithful to the Lord. So we have the promises of scripture like in Isaiah 11. A prophecy of the one who would come from the righteous branch of the root of Jesse, who would be the the deliverer, the Messiah, the promised son of David. He'd be the real fulfillment. See, in one way, Solomon was the partial fulfillment of the covenant promises God made to David. That he would have a son on his throne, but he is not the ultimate fulfillment of the son whose reign would be eternal and forever. And Isaiah 11, 2 uh, 2 through 5 says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, He shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Do you see the similarity in language there between our passage in Proverbs and this prophecy of of, of the promised king and son of David? The same words. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, the fear of the Lord, righteousness, justice, and equity. This king, this son of David will be faithful. He will judge righteously in righteousness and in equity. He is the fulfillment of that prophecy. In the incarnation, wisdom stepped into this world. Wisdom stepped foot into this world. He took on flesh and tabernacled with his people. Luke 2 tells us as as Jesus grew, he grew in wisdom and stature with both God and man. He is like the the, the son that the father is pleading with in Proverbs. He's the one actually fulfilling this and walking it out. Jesus himself declared that he is the better Solomon, the better king, the true fulfillment of the covenant promises. 
When the religious leaders sought to test him and, and demanded a sign from him to prove that he was who he said he was, he rebukes them. He rebukes them because they, they don't have a teachable and humble heart to see who it is that is standing before them. And he says in Matthew twelve forty two, the queen of the south, which is the queen of Sheba, will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Think about that. Proverbs created this prophetic expectation in God's people for a son who fulfills the book. And then we have Jesus. Just the embodiment of the book. He's the ideal king. He is the faithful son. And he is the one you and I need to have a relationship with in order to be wise. We will not have wisdom without that. Amen. So it's not a surprise, brothers and sisters, when we read in the New Testament that Christ is the wisdom of God. That he's the wisdom from God. And that in him are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So we can't know wisdom apart from him, brothers and sisters. To know Christ is to know wisdom. And to know wisdom is to know Christ.